This episode of Grilled by the Staff Canteen is sponsored by Westlands, the premier specialist British grower of microleaf, growing cresses, edible flowers, inspired leaves, sea herbs and specialty tomatoes. Visit www.westlandsuk.co.uk to find out more. Thanks for downloading Grilled by the Staff Canteen. I'm Cara, editor of the Staff Canteen, and from everyone in our team, we hope everyone is staying home, staying safe and making the best of their free time. This episode was recorded last month, so it offers a much needed break from coronavirus. Uh, We were at Marna in Manchester with chef owner Simon Martin. Simon has previously worked at the Chester Grosvenor, restaurant Gordon Ramsay and Noma, where he was for three years before opening Marna in 2018. He spoke to our founder Mark Morris about why he wanted to open the restaurant, why he loves having the dining room in the kitchen, plus breaking the Michelin curse for Manchester. This is grilled by the staff canteen. Thank you very much for agreeing to do it. Uh, it's fantastic to come up into Manchester. Um, talk us through Restaurant Manor. Uh, well, obviously there's a lot to get to. <laughs> um, I opened a restaurant because um, ultimately I wanted to have my own restaurant. I think it's always been a something I aspired to do. If it wasn't going to do this, then it would definitely be something completely different. Uh, probably wouldn't be in kitchens anymore. But after I left uh, Noma, obviously, it was, I didn't want to work anybody else for anyone else. And at the time, girlfriend was sort of on my case about coming back to England. She didn't want to do long distance anymore. Obviously, I'd been a chef, travelled around a hell of a lot for you know, 15, 16 years, however long it was. And uh, yeah, she was a nurse in Manchester. So I thought, where better to do it than here? And uh, yeah, nice to break the little Michelin curse as well at the same time. So yeah. we'll we'll come on to that. But let, let, let's just talk about the restaurant at the moment. It's a it's a it's a really open space, very clean, yeah. very very simple, very minimalistic. I guess would would be kind of um, a, a way of describing it. Just just we're on a podcast, just for the purpose of kind of paint a picture of the restaurant. So it's a big open space. It's not massive. I think the the height of the ceiling is probably uh, bigger than the front to the back. Um, but yeah, it's it's quite um, minimalistic, as you said. I don't really like busy spaces because I, I can't really concentrate in them. Everything needs to be organised and uh, you know, like so simplistic. So it's sort of when we did the design, we just wanted something that was a little bit Nordic inspired, I suppose. Not because of my time at Noma, but because I have, uh, uh, you know, my. Family history is is uh, it's from Norway originally, so it's always sort of something that resonated with me. And you know, people have this sort of design that they always adhere to, I suppose, when their offices or their flats or their houses. And, and for me, it was it was uh, always geared towards that sort of style. And you can you can definitely see that. I mean, it's 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 got Noma, it's got geranium, it's it, a very sort of open plan. Mm. You know, the kitchen is very much central to the restaurant. Um, how, how important is that to you? Is, is, is that theatre element important in the restaurant? I think that's probably one of the biggest contributing factors to our success, actually, just because it's never been done in such an open environment before. I always loved working in open kitchens when I was you know, working in other people's restaurants, and I thought, what better thing to do than to take it a step further and see what happens and... Yeah, I mean, we don't even say the kitchen's in the dining room. We say the dining room's in the kitchen. So we have 26 guests that are all essentially sitting at a chef's table, um, completely open, no walls, no counter. You know, it's people can see our feet. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's great and it's brilliant for the chefs. And I think it's something that a lot of chefs really appreciate is being able to be out there and uh, being seen and being able to, to communicate with the people they're cooking for because it doesn't make sense to not to. Uh, during the, uh, the the filming of the video that obviously we're here to make as well today, you talked about um, sort of well-being of the team and how important that was to you. J- just talk us through when you're open, the hours the staff do, and how do you manage that sort of shift now to, you know, making sure that staff get the right time off but still deliver a really good product? I always say to the staff, working here is a sprint. It's not a marathon. You know, you're here for four days a week, um, once a month you're here for four and a half days we work half a tuesday just to get ahead for things that need to ferment or infuse on the on the week um we have enough staff that's you know the biggest part of it i suppose so that people have to don't have to do as many hours 
Um, you know, it's 50 and chefs in a kitchen that caters to 26 guests. It's a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, but if you're writing a business plan, would that work straight away? Straight, straight away, no, absolutely not. No, when we opened, we were ninety-five pounds for the menu, and that only just covered the food cost. So it very much took um, some continual investment throughout the first year in order to get a name for ourselves and build a reputation, so that we were able to put the prices up to accommodate pe- ultimately people's well-being, but also the evolution of the menu as well. So, so what 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 hours do the team do now? Then talk, talk us through the hours they do. So on a Wednesday they come in at uh, between nine thirty and ten, and then they'll work they'll work through to you know the end of the night. They have two breaks that total an hour and a half during the day. Normally on a normal night we'll get out at around eleven thirty, and then they're back in again the next day for the same for the same amount of time. But lunch Thursday to Saturday, so we really have to make sure that we're very very organised and you know getting for, ready for lunch and an hour and a half um, you know it can be difficult when you, you know we're prepping the whole menu every day so we just have to be really efficient and organised and just sit down and, and you know whenever we face a problem we just organise our way out of it you know that's always what we've done and so well, what do we do it's like it's not work more hours it's let's organise better in order to make it so that they have a you know they have less time in work things get done faster so everything has more life it just works really well for us in, in the sense of the way that we work um, and the staff get to have enough time off. You know, yeah, it's a long day still when you're here, but it's four days a week, and it's it could be a lot worse. You know, there was a time last year when it wasn't like this. You know, this is something we're really concentrating on this year. Whereas initially, like, it's, you know, it's it was about hitting the ground running. It was about you know pushing on and getting ourselves up there, which I think that we've done. Um, now, obviously, it's more steady improvement that we're looking to to go for. You know, we're still only just shy of 18 months old in a restaurant's timeline. It's we're, very young, right? We're, we're babies, yeah, yeah. We're absolute babies, yeah, yeah. Um, compared to some some restaurants that we're being compared to and we're going, you know, we're going up uh, with awards um, alongside these incredible restaurants. You know, we're number three in the UK in Harden's in our first year. It's, that's got to be one of the highest ever entries, if not the highest, I'm not sure. I mean, that's not fact, but I can't imagine many people go in that high and you see, you see the list of restaurants you know, preceding us, and we're just, I'm just like, how has this happened? But we did, that was a massive push. I don't think I've ever slept as little before in my life. You know, when I left Noma, um, people asked what was it, what it was like working there, and I was like, it was hard. Like, it was hard, it was a sacrifice, it was a graft, and I never thought... I'll bet you pick herbs better than anyone else. <laughs> Initially, yeah, I mean... <laughs> You do There's a lot of her picking at Noma, right? Yeah, I mean, you tend to move on from that um, when you get employed. But, um, yeah, I, I couldn't imagine working that hard. I, I mean, I intended to come into this restaurant working just as hard as I yeah. did at Noma, and then when we opened it, came very quickly apparent about a month in that this was going to be much harder, and, you know, it's more mental than physical. Yeah. Is but, that because the buck stops with you? Yeah, I mean... You know, no, no disrespect. You're part of a massive team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, people. you know, and there's a structure there. There's Rennie, and there's a, and, there, and there's, you know, all, all of his team. And, and here, you are chef patron. So ultimately, your name is above the door. The buck stops with you. Exactly. So does that bring the added pressure? It brings a lot of responsibility, and especially in terms of managing an entire team and not just a kitchen. You know, I've got front of house to manage. I've got a PA to manage. I've got a cleaner. I've got, um, I've got a reservations manager and. And I've got a business. How do you make that anything? transition then? Because that's one of the things I always think chefs struggle with. They're all brilliant cooks mm. and they get to where they get to because they are brilliant cooks. Yeah. Suddenly, you have to look at a P&L and you have to make a profit. And, you, and like you say, you have to manage a cleaner. and all. How do you make that transition? I think you just sort of stumble. Right. <laughs> you just... You know, so it's trial and error. Yeah, absolutely. It's like starting all over again. It was for me anyway. I mean... I've always been business minded because I grew up in a family which always had a business and you know I remember hearing things, I mean, my mum and dad used to talk in the kitchen about the business constantly, that's all they ever used to talk about and uh, I remember hearing things then that are relevant now uh, in, in, in my role but uh, yeah I think it is always just whenever anybody gets plunged into that business world it's it's a struggle and it's a stumble until you sort of find your feet but we're very lucky and 
the sense that I found some fantastic business partners, very successful. A um, couple of gentlemen uh, who have you know been in business for fifteen years, and they were able to advise me and. You know, they've always wanted it. How do you do that though? Because every chef wants to open a restaurant. Mm. I've never met a chef who's not 30 something and wants to open his own restaurant. The, bi- the biggest challenge any chef has is finding that financial backer to do it. Because mm. very few chefs have 250K in the bank oh, that they can just go and find a space and then, and then open a restaurant. So mm. what's the process of finding, you come out of Noma, mm-hmm. you want to open your own space. What is the process of finding those backers? So I left Noma I came back home and immediately started working on this restaurant. Okay. I, I'm not, this isn't a good advice, I don't think. But <laughs> the way I did it, isn't it? It was extremely risky. Okay. Um, but I came and I essentially did everything and acted as if I had the money. Okay. Um, created a logo. I did all this from home. I've always been quite computer literate. Yeah. Created a logo and create social media accounts. It was actually through a friend who I'd met at Noma, who had, okay. a res- who had a restaurant on Great Ancoat Street, and I just messaged him saying, how would you go about finding property? Yeah. And then all of a sudden he was posting it on his Twitter account. He only had like 2,000 followers. It wasn't massive, um, but it was enough for Manchester Evening News to pick it up. Okay. And then it was on Manchester Evening News that this ex Noma chef was opening a restaurant in Manchester and all of a sudden a load of interest sort of started flying in. So that made it a little bit more of a reality. So you use social media to create a buzz? Absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, with, to, to this day, we've never paid a penny for advertising. Yeah. It's all been done on social media. Okay. Um, but we, uh, we sort of did everything as if we had the money. Yeah. Like, I got in contact with the kitchen designer, got yeah. in, ta- in touch with the fit-out company, with Riche and CHR, and, you know, I sat there doing you know multiple meetings with chr designing the kitchen and then eventually they were like right you've had quite a bit of our time now yeah you need to sign this to say that well they said you need to sign this to say that if you don't pay you're going to be liable for a percentage of the cost which on a three hundred fifty thousand pound kitchen is you know no small amount of money and all i'd add is you know being a chef you don't really earn that much money yeah um a few hundred quid in the bank just to sort of pay for my petrol to get to manchester for meetings and things like that um, but yeah, I just did it. I just signed it, and I was just, I was just so determined to make it happen. I was just, you know, it's going to happen whether anybody likes it or not. I was googling angel investors and, and all sorts. But then eventually, um, obviously Joel and Mike, uh, my business partners, they Joel messaged me on LinkedIn and said, "Look, uh, do you have time for me?" And I just want to tell you where I feel like a lot of restaurants in Manchester fall short. Can you tell us what their background is, or is yeah, that, yeah, yeah, no, it's not complicated at all. It's um, yeah, so they have a essentially a wealth management company. Okay, yeah. They do, they do insurance, uh, they work with a lot of uh, sports people. Um, but yeah, that's what they do. But they're just, you know, successful now. Um, and are they the type of people that are looking for investment opportunities? Uh, are yeah. they food people? I mean, what, Yeah, I mean, they're just, what, yeah. Why, why a restaurant, why you? Because I, I, I guess, so, they, they, you know, people with money are approached all the time for, yeah. here's the latest thing that's gonna be, you know, it's gonna sell trillions. Mm. So, so why you, why, why this concept? Joel tells me, I don't know how true this is, but Joel tells me that he wanted to invest in a restaurant, to invest in a chef with a good background so that he could get a table at a good restaurant locally. Okay, fair enough. Which is brilliant yeah. and hilariously funny because now he can't get a table. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that's what they tell me. I think, you know, people like that people like Joel and Mike they're always looking for new opportunities and they're always looking to you know it's, it's, it's an interest more than anything it's something outside of their industry um, which you know they just wanted to sort of get into and I think a lot of people want to just have an address it's like years ago people wanted to have a pub because they just like the idea of it the food, food is very popular chefs are very rock and roll you know it's mm. it, it, it you know chefs have been for the last 20 years um, okay, so I mean, I guess, like you say, that's really, really important because when you first open, your menu price is just and just covering the food bill, right? Yeah, yeah. So you needed that investment ultimately for working capital and to see you through. Yeah. So what becomes what becomes the tipping point then? What what makes the restaurant start becoming profitable? I think when you can get your prices to a point, you know, you can get your prices to a point where people pay it, but you're still making some money on yeah. that. Um, we're fortunate we have a fantastic sommelier who chooses really good wines and you know a lot of our 
the money that we make that sustains the business comes from wet sales. Uh, in terms of food sales, you know, we're it's still it's a low GP compared to most restaurants. You know, very low. But that's just because that we want to work with the best ingredients and we want to do it every day. Um, and especially for me as well, something that I found that drives me is having my personality come across in the food. And I don't like mediocre things. So I like luxury ingredients because I didn't grow up with those things. Um, I was never really into food growing up massively until I started working in kitchens. So, you know, I want white truffle and caviar, and good caviar on the menu and, you know, things like langoustines and wagyu beef and because that just reflects my personality and that's what I want to cook. And I also want the guys here to work with the best ingredients. So that's just what makes sense. But for that, we need to, you know, yeah, we need to put prices up, but I don't want people to suffer for my personality <laughs> financially. So we always do it at, at a price which, yeah, it sustains us and we have to have a safety net, of course, but, you know, we're not making a lot and that was never the plan here to do that. Maybe that might come in 10 years' time when I want to go and open a bistro. Yeah. So before the start, you, you, you know, you said you're only 18 months old. How do you, because there are lots of great restaurants in Manchester, you know, casual dining, fine dining, you know, as we said earlier, Manchester's becoming a real hub for, mm. for great food, you know, from everything, from great tapas through to, to, to whatever you want. How do you make the restaurant as a new restaurant stand out? Well, I believe that nobody was really doing anything, really committing to this sector before we came along. And I think there's probably an argument there to say that they were, but in my mind, if you're going to do this, you might as well do it full on, like we're opening four days a week, we're restricting covers, we're getting the best ingredients, we have the best facility. Something breaks, it's bought brand new the next day. You know, my bio prep broke yesterday, there's a brand new one in it this morning. You know, things like that and really enabling people to, to be at the top of their game. That for me is what this sector is about. And it's not to make money. There are many, many successful restaurants in the sector that do make money but it's not in the first 18 months and especially, no. you know, nine times out of 10, not in the first five years. Yeah. Yeah. So I think too many people open restaurants and try and have too much of a safety net in this sector and they end up ultimately failing because when people come to a restaurant like this, they expect the best. And if you're making a considerable amount of profit, you're probably not making it the best it can be. Yeah. So. I mean, obviously, you, you know, you've got, you've got to start, um, you, bro you broke that 40 years hoodwink that Manchester had um, we saw the documentary with Simon and Aidan mm. you know um, getting a star in Manchester and it was all it was all very public and almost this competitive thing attached to it yeah what was getting a star something you guys set out to do I mean you've talked a lot about luxury ingredients about not making money and, and all and, and you know being absolutely focused on on, on this sector so mm. at what point did you think yeah we want a star we can get a star this is this is what we're going for about four months in I would say when the feedback really started to come in after we were a little bit settled and people started making comparisons to other restaurants that had stars I think then we saw I started I always believe my guests that come here and give us honest feedback so obviously I believe that when they said it was just as good as you know one two three mission star restaurants that they've been to before if not better um, so I believe that and then I obviously it went through my mind it's like well maybe we could get a star as well but it's always been about the guests. So, you know, we've always cooked for the guests. Um, whether we had a star or not, it wouldn't have really changed anything. We will, still would have continued on this path. And you know, yes, Michelin have boosted getting the star. It's, it's massively boosted the uh, the bookings. You know, we can hardly budge for reservations. We want to give reservations to people, but we can't. We just don't have space. Um, but even after the Marino uh review in the Times. We were, we were still looking then at like three months in advance it was there were a few tables but it, it was busy enough to keep us afloat until now so it, you know nothing really would have changed that much we still would have put the menu price up we still would have like sort of to incorporate more luxury ingredients and we would have been doing what we're doing with the staff because you know my staff here aren't fickle but if we hadn't got the star then they might have been looking you know after working here to be to be moving on to somewhere else with one just for their cvs yeah. um but it could kept them around but the only other way that I could have kept them around was by doing this as well is by making a really good environment for them to work in a really progressive one at the same time as well not just good but progressive yeah you're you're in a city with 
two of the world's biggest football teams. Mm. You know, whether you like them or loathe them, City, United, they're, they're mass- So there's money in this city. Yeah. But why do you think it's not been achieved before then in terms of the start? Uh, it's difficult to answer, isn't it? Because I've never been in those restaurants. I don't know what they were doing. I don't. You know. I think it's it's definitely a myth that people thought because people said Manchester's never going to get a star, right? It, yeah. It was, you know, Manchester's not going to get a star. Yeah, I mean that was that was obviously a myth. Clear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't want to piss anyone off, but it's you know, Mitchell looked for something, and you know, yeah. if that's not there. They're not going to award a star. Yeah. And that's the reason why I respect the guide so much is because they have high standards and they look for you know specific things in in the cooking and in the in the chef and in the rest uh, in the restaurant in terms of the chef and how he communicates with, you know how he interacts with the restaurant. And, um, I've never been to a bad Michelin star restaurant, so that's why getting a star for me was probably the biggest achievement. So let's go back to talk about the team. You know, you, you said about how hard work it was when you opened. Mm-hmm. Who who were your lieutenants? Who were the guys in the kitchen that you couldn't have done without? Uh, definitely Connor, the sous chef. I mean, Connor actually. He so where, where's your where does your relationship with Connor start? Where, where do you know him from? He just applied through. He was working at Manchester House before here. And okay. He, he just applied for a, for a job. He was twenty, either twenty or twenty one. He's twenty two now. Um, when he applied, and the only position I saw him in at that point, with his experience and his age, was as a commie chef. So he started as a commie and then very very quickly moved through the ranks, and now he's a sous chef, and I can't. Imagine this kitchen running without him now, actually. So hopefully it takes for a very long time. But yeah, obviously he's the sous chef. We have Dan, who's the kitchen manager as well. So Dan uh, is a chef, but he works on very much of, like the administration side of everything. He takes care of the suppliers and the, the health and safety, you know, the, the costings for the menu, um, all, the, all the procurement of anything that's also not to do with food, all that sort of thing. And just very much looks after the team and is there to fill in wherever we need him, sort of like a plus one as well. Um, so we have this structure of management where there's the three of us. Obviously, Connor is a sous chef, runs the kitchen, makes sure the standards are adhered to, and you know, is in charge of training almost because I very much imprinted the standards that I wanted on him and everyone else. But especially he's somebody who really took it on board, so he knows exactly what I want and what I'm looking for, and you know, I can I can really trust him. And obviously, Dan who handles, handles the administration side, which leaves me solely to just to to, uh, to create and just work on the menu and all the other little bits. You know, I'm I'm really just in charge of making sure the restaurant's moving forwards. I mean, obviously, making the decisions in the direction of the business, but just constantly working on on getting better and all, all the time. And uh, and we have Anna as well. Recently, just come into working on the R and D with me as well. And in terms of your two investors, how much involvement do they have on a day to day basis? Uh, I think they they leave me to it a lot, but that's a good thing, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean they're there whenever I need them. Yeah, you know whenever I'm stuck or I or need when advice. They need, when they need a table, they give you a call, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you I mean, in? even some even life advice sometimes. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah of course, you know, absolutely, absolutely. Somebody that's you know this business is my life. This yeah. restaurant is my life. So everything revolves around this. And sometimes I just want to go up to them and just say, "Have you been through this? Like, what did you do?" Yeah. Nine times out of ten, uh, nine times out of ten, they they laugh and say, "Yeah, of course we've been through that." Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so. I think it's difficult. You know, we we, we did a, uh, an interview with Paul um, Paul Ainsworth uh, very recently, and I think people see chefs, and as I said before, they're very rock and roll, they're very high profile, lots of chefs on TV, media, so on and so forth. Um, and I think a lot of young chefs look at that and they go, "Oh yeah, I'd love to aspire to that." You know, Paul said he's he's you know he's got two point seven million on the line. You know that that's what Reggiano is. is you've said basically you put everything on the line, mm. uh, and and were almost like a little bit fraudulent. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. One of the better descriptions. Yeah, you can but say that. But I, I guess the thing is, you know, there's a massive risk involved in what you guys do to make it success. It it it, and with that comes the limelight. You know, it, yeah. but but it's yeah. not the limelight first, right? I guess. Is what no, I'm of course to say. not. No, You've, but do you think some even, some some young chefs today are looking for a media exposure before they've got their product right? Potentially, I mean, if they do that, it's completely backwards, as you just said. You know, it's not; it doesn't work like that. And even now, you know, yeah, we got the star and everything, but work's not done here. I work harder now than ever before. Yeah, um, because I've got a reputation to keep and a, and a standard to to not only aspire to, but to keep driving upwards. Yeah. Um, there's no look right. I might get a free pint if I go to like a pub that I know in Manchester where I know the people. Or they know me, 
but other than that, there's no, there's no luxuries in you know, really. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's just an achievement for us as far as I'm concerned, um, and a recommendation for Michelin's users to, to go to. And in terms of like TV and things, like, I'm not even interested in that. I'd, I'll come back and ask you in five years the same question. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, it might be completely different in five years, but right now. This is like it's a very new restaurant, and I'm I'm only concentrating. You'll make a lot more money doing the TV. <laughs> but at the same time, yeah, I understand that. But Which is why I'll ask you again in five years. Yeah, yeah. So let's it's talk it. about your food. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, clearly, Nome is a big influence on you. We can see the sort of the, the, the Nordic approach to the restaurant. Let's talk about the food. How you know? I apologise, we've asked you this already. How do you describe your food style? It's the worst question ever. But how do you describe your food style? It is very natural. We don't try. What does that mean? In terms of we don't uh, we don't over complicate. We don't we don't manipulate food too much. Okay. We like to keep things in its natural state as much as possible, and we'll only ever apply anything to any ingredient if it makes it better. Okay. If something's better raw than yeah. it is cooked or compressed or. So you don't or, take a carrot, dehydrate it, turn it into a crumb, sprinkle it. Well, no, because it's, it's a carrot. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> let a carrot be. I mean, you could you know, see the pictures of the food that we do. We always try to. You know, elevate the natural form of something, and that's what manna means. It's, it's the one of the definitions anyway, and the one that we took from from the definition of manna is uh, somebody who is almost a channeler of nature. So, the worst person to be a channel of nature is, would be somebody that turns it on its head and makes it something that it's not. So we we you know I've always just seen it as you know we're just uh, you know representing the elements here and, and the elements are everything you know they're, they're responsible for for life um so it goes quite far back but you know we, we don't mess with things too much we, we use the best ingredients preservation is a massive part of what we do um is that from your time in in in, in the sort of nordic countries it came to me and that's where i learned how to do it yes but Preservation isn't exclusively Nordic. No, you know, it's no. Uh, fermentation. Well, you know, fermentation happened thousands of years ago naturally. Yeah, you know, it's not. But, but equally, we don't. You know, if we're being really cynical, we don't need to preserve things. You no, know, you, but you that's can get not most, 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 most. Well, of course you can. Yeah, if you get it from Peru. But if you want to use, <laughs> you want to use cherries in. Okay, so in that's January. Why, yeah. Okay, so that's why you're doing it. You're, you're taking the the. The food when it's at its best, yes, and then preserving it, yes, okay, because we don't want to be restricted just by what's available in its fresh form. Yeah, you know, a lot of things are better when they're preserved as well. Yeah, and this just it, it opens our larder up throughout the entire year. You know, we've, we're using cherries right now, but they were preserved in July last year yeah. when they were in season. Yeah. So we can be using British produce at any time of the year, no matter right. what it is. Okay. I don't want to buy shit from Peru. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, no, that makes well, sense. You know, that makes sense. So. But I think, again, you know, Noma has created a massive, you know, everyone suddenly was a forager. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you were in the mid, you know, Glyn Pennell has a has a brilliant saying, and and his saying is, and and, you know, you can't forage in Birmingham because all you get is crisp wrappers and dog shit, Mm. right? (laughs) But you had chefs going out foraging that were in central London. Uh, uh, and so that's my, that was my point is why, why are you preserving you don't need to preserve no. but understand what you're saying is that you're, do, you're taking the best when the product's at its best yeah. and then preserving it and using it at another day yeah so rather than just following a fashion yeah we're not following a fashion it's just it's what defines what we do and it's, it's being a truly British kitchen is by using British ingredients when they're at the breast preserving them if possible and, and you know we pres- preservation is never normally a focal point of what we do on a, on a serving. It's normally something to enhance something that is in season. Yeah. And that goes back to where well, many chefs probably don't know this, but they are in some in some way inspired by Kaiseki cuisine, you know, the original sort of multi-serving menu, um, where it has to be seasonal, it has to have a sense of balance and a flow, and seasonality isn't just restricted to what's there right now. You know, there is a word, I can't remember the name of it, in Kaiseki for, you know, seasons past, incorporating something into a menu from seasons past. Okay. They even take it a step further and make something look like it will do in the future, like through vegetable carving or something like that. So, you know, this again, it's nothing new. It's just being truly representative of, of your country's cuisine. And, you know, like I said, we don't really use it. 
enough shellfish and fish because we're an island and we don't use it. I know it's not, that bit's nuts. Yeah. yeah. You know, everybody's yeah. so meat driven. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So what's what's a typical dish then? You know, if there is such a tip, thing as a typical dish here at Manor, what what would that be? I mean, obviously we've got things like our staples, things that have been on the menu for a while that guests really love. Obviously the langoustine is one of them. Um, which, funnily enough, if we're going to talk about anything that came from Noma, it would be that, but not in the sense that it was on the menu at Noma. We had a langoustine serving on the menu, and we had a cured egg yolk sauce. It was not the same one as we're using here now, but it was a, a guy called Jose Luis um, who was on the hot section inside. I'm pretty sure he did this because he cooked too many langoustines, right? So he just wanted to get them out the kitchen so nobody could see he'd cooked too many bloody expensive langoustines from Norway. And he just wanted to get them out the kitchen, so he sort of, he was a master of cover-ups. This guy who, no, I'm going to say that. Come on, <laughs> come on, you're halfway there now. <laughs> so he's, somehow he managed to make it look like he was the busiest person in the kitchen while actually achieving nothing. It was, it was, a, it was, it was almost an art. Form. That's a skill, right? Yeah, yeah no, it's, is, <laughs> it really was. Skill. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so he puts this um, this egg yolk sauce on top of these langoustines to try and make it look like it was a, a little gift for the guys on the barbecue outside. And he came out and he gave them to us. I ate it. I thought it was fucking brilliant. I loved it. Um, so yeah, that's what that serving was inspired by. We put a few more things on it when we put it on the menu here, but. Yeah, it's just really, really good serving here, and that is something that uses fermentation as well in, in the way that we season the sauce. Um, I don't know, the, the, the menu's constantly evolving, and I'm changing a lot as well. I found that I want different things from the food. I think it's very much a natural process. It's not just me and many chefs as they um, progress in their career in terms of menu development as they start taking things away, because it's... It's hard. It is harder, and it shows more skill, but it's also more clear as to what you're trying to achieve with things, and you know what might appear very easy to digest mentally for a chef, because it's it's in your head, it's in your mind. Um, for a guest, might just be a bit too overwhelming, I suppose, in terms of a range of textures. You know, people are always trying to incorporate every texture, every flavour, salt, sweet, sour. You know. Um, I think that's really interesting. A lot. Of, we're really fortunate. We come and speak to a lot of you guys. And it's one thing that really sticks in my mind is the more successful the chefs become, um, I don't know if it's the right term, but the simpler their food becomes. Yeah. And I, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way because they use the best ingredients, but they have the confidence to say it doesn't need that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely what it comes down to is confidence. And you know, we've just put this oyster serving on, um, which we're going to do today, which is incredibly simple. But it's clear, it has a clear message, it's refined, we use the best ingredients, yeah. you know, it's been done properly every yeah. time. There's a and simple doesn't mean lack of technique either, does no, it? No, not at all. No, I mean, we've got, you know, there's two ferments in the sauce that we serve with this oyster. You know, it's, it's a process that takes quite a, a lot of expensive equipment and, you know, the sourcing of the oysters, they need to come in every day. Um, you know, the wasabi needs to be, take every single... You know, wasabi changes. Um, I don't know whether we've ever seen a, a, yeah. a wasabi. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it fr from the from the top to the bottom. And fresh. What, what on earth happens from that green stuff you get in packets to fresh? Yeah, I mean it's it's not wasabi. Exactly, it? exactly. Yeah, packets, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. It's imitation. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but that changes throughout the course of that. So it's for me. If we take it's better because if we take things away, there's less to look after. Yeah. And we can be more um, intrinsic about how we're treating everything because then if there's only three things in this oyster shell the oyster the sauce and the wasabi obviously there's more ingredients involved but then every single time we grind that wasabi we can grind that seconds before it goes out to the restaurant and every single time we do it we can taste a little bit because we've got time we've got a million things going on the yeah. plate we can taste it and then we can just the amount is necessary i think that's where really the skill of a chef comes in is like you said to be confident to take things away and and just say look this is what this is if you're having 18 servings on a menu anyway, do you really want to taste eight things on each serving? I, I don't think I would anymore. The menu was extremely complicated when we first opened and, and all last year actually, there was a lot of complexity to everything, but I just, I, at the end of the day, I want to cook what I want to eat. And I think about eating that oyster and I want to keep going back to it. I want to keep eating it. So I think that's whatever happens, at least I'm saying true to what I want to eat and what I think is right. But I do genuinely think that you really show the maturity in a chef when they start to take things away. 
So let's talk about the future of Manor then. You, you know, huge success. You've got a star in number three in Harden, as you said. Uh, you, you had a, a thing today to say you're, you're up for GQ Restaurant of the Year. Yeah. yeah. Um, Great company, though. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what, what, what's the future? What, how, do you, how do you keep your feet on the ground but keep moving forward? You know, your profile is clearly going to raise. You know, what, what's the future for you in the restaurant? Honestly, I just want to keep improving it. And that, that we'll see where it takes us. I think that's the most important thing to do. Is you know, I'm not this garrulous, garrulous uh, industry presence or social media presence. I just want to get my head down, work, and make sure that the people that are enabling me to do this in terms of the team feel like they're really a part of something, and they're, they're happy with their lives, and they're happy with their work, and they feel like they're progressing. That's you know, whatever comes comes. I think you have to take each day as it is not if you look too far ahead in the future or try and set obviously we have to have goals and we have to have a plan but you know working towards one thing doesn't make sense to me anymore i think we just take each day at a time try and be just try and be better every day and you know, a lot of chefs say this but it, it is something that really pays off if you just come in every day you try and be better work hard and be nice to people and that's that's about it and in, you meant you mentioned social media there um, you know, you don't want a big social media presence, but it is, it's become intrinsic in all of our lives now. So how, how do you play the social media game or don't you? We want to keep people interested. I mean, I'm, I'm in charge of our social media accounts. Okay. You know, obviously my personal ones on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram are also the same for Manor. Um, we did have somebody doing our social media for us and then I wasn't happy because I didn't feel like, you know, no one's going to be able to re represent this restaurant the way I want it to, other than myself. Ultimately, you know, not in 100% of its, of its light. Um, we want to keep people interested in what we're doing at the restaurant, so we do post, but it's not like five times a week. I mean, it's probably once a week that we post on 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 Manners uh, Instagram or or so any social media. And then for me, it's normally when you know mine's a little bit less serious. Um, I like to post stories of the chefs dancing around. And yeah, but that shows character, right? Yeah, it I mean, shows I personality. Think, yeah, I think if anybody looks at a restaurant and it's just so serious, yeah, so yeah. you know, you can be professional. Yeah, of course. And have a good time. Yeah, at the yeah, same yeah. Time, absolutely, you know, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We bought a Hoover that goes on someone's back, and I've still got to buy a Boba Fett mask um, for whoever's gonna gonna be using it, so I can post so what, that. So why a Hoover <laughs> on someone's back? What's oh, uh, so <laughs> you know, Boba Fett from Star Wars? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. He has, oh, a, he has okay. a jetpack. Okay, <laughs> I am not a Star Wars. Oh, wait, no. Sorry, oh, sorry. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, massively in Star Wars so I just assume everyone else is but it's like football I'm not into football so. um, you know, someone says what team do you support I'm sort of no one and they just like look at me shocked uh, but yes yeah, so it's, it's I can understand <laughs> that more than someone being into Star Wars personally oh yeah right, right. Right. <laughs> um, yeah we had this Boba Fett not Boba Fett we had this um, vacuum okay that goes on your back yeah and then it sort of looks like you're wearing a jetpack okay so I've been joking for a while that I'm going to get a Boba Fett mask for whoever <laughs> Uh, has to vacuum the floor so that it can look like Boba Fett. Oh, wait, <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, there's also two sides to social media as well. There's the, you know, there's the, there's the good, there's the positive things going out there. But there's also, you know, um, the, the negative reviews, the TripAdvisor, that type of thing. How do you handle that as a business? And I'm not saying all TripAdvisor is negative, by the way. No, it's not. I mean, we've had some great feedback yeah, on show TripAdvisor. Me, show me if he doesn't win Restaurant of the Year, a TripAdvisor is... is oh, and telling everyone about it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, yeah. and then two seconds later, he's moaning about a bad review he's got on TripAdvisor, yeah. so, or she. I mean, we've had a couple of, like, either unfair or just completely fake reviews and people haven't actually visited. Um, How do you deal with that? I just contact TripAdvisor and tell them to take it down. Okay. No, it's pretty easy to see through the lines. If someone hasn't been here, they don't mention any of the food, they can't... They can't really reference anything they've yeah. had here, and I just, I just go on to say it's TripAdvisor. Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be really, really simple that they had to post a receipt? It would be, but uh, yeah, that's more verification required, isn't it? So I don't, I don't really, really know what TripAdvisor's capacity is, but you know, we don't generally reply to TripAdvisor reviews because we think if you reply to one, you reply to all. I recently, I had one that was so full of lies that I felt it was necessary to reply to it just because I didn't want anybody even thinking that there was an iota of truth in any of it. Um, but you know, I don't have time to reply to every TripAdvisor review. But it does kill me every time we get bad feedback. Yeah. Absolutely kills me. Yeah. You know, because we're so used to getting good feedback as well. And you don't think about good feedback. You think about you only remember the bad. It's like the naughty kid in school. The teacher knows his name first. Yeah. Um, but you know, and then all the social media. Really, yeah, I mean, people get bad press, but we haven't really had much. And I think that's uh, something that you do just deal. 
you learn to cope with as time goes on. Initially, if you got a bad review, it destroy me for a week. Now it mainly you know, might only destroy me for a day now. So hopefully that continues and it'll just become something where you know I acknowledge it and I form my own opinion and react wherever necessary. You know, we do get, you know, somebody said the music was too loud on Saturday, so we turn the music down. It's fine, you know. <laughs> we can't have, you know, some people that love loud music and some people that love low music, so we found a middle ground to try and accommodate for as many people as possible. It's the same with the food. You know, we've had, we've had a couple of servings on the menu where we think it's absolutely incredible because we're, you know, we have very strong flavours in this restaurant. And we think it's amazing because we eat these strong flavours every day, almost on four days a week. And so then we find something when we're really pushing the boundaries of, of flavour and then we had some people said, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's got too much flavour. And we were sort of like, how can that be feedback? How can you not want to finish something because it has too much flavour? But, you know, when you think about it, you know, it is. Yeah. It's absolutely, yeah. you know, um, I guess it's valid. overpowering. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, yeah. I mean, things can be balanced and strong flavours, which I think that we, we were doing. We weren't overpowering anything else with it, but... Just in general, it was just too much. So we had to dial that back, and we were end up taking that serving off the menu. Or, no, we changed it to a different version of that serving. But, you know, that's valuable feedback. I think you just have to sort of come to your own decision whether yeah. something is Yeah. Valuable. Last question for you. So you've moved back to Manchester, girlfriend's happy, mm -hmm. okay? When you take some time away from this business, where do you like to go and eat? Ah, uh, so I've been to Hall five times. Okay, with Mark. Yeah, yeah, I love it there. Okay. Um, Why? What's special about Moor Hall for you? I, it's just I just have a really good time there. I feel like I'm in great surroundings, and obviously we've got we're friends of the restaurant, and Mark was great, especially in the first year in terms of answering any questions that I had. I know that he's he's extremely driven, just as I am. So it's always good to find yeah. somebody that you have something in common with yeah. and see what their opinions on yeah. are. Um, I just, the food's fun, like brilliant. You know, everything's delicious. Um, it's a great setting. And uh, well, recently it's been more research for everybody to, you know, I initially went to see his kitchen with the people who did our kitchen and then, then took a few people from here just so that I could, I could show them the standards that we wanted to work to. Obviously he's achieved a hell of a lot since he's been open in a very short space of time as well. Um, but yeah, just a fantastic role model, fantastic businessman someone that I admire massively. I think five times at more halls enough now, I probably need to <laughs> go what, what, somewhere what, else. What's, what's, your, what's your sort of dirty food secret? Where, you know, where would, where, you know, is it, is it a fillet of fish at 11 o'clock at night? What's your, no, you know, more, hall, more halls kind of out there on its own, right? right? Yeah. So, so what, what's your sort of dirty food pleasure? I've been asked this so many times. There was three articles done in Manchester oh, is it? Last, last year. Um, three different publications asking me to comment on what my guilty pleasure is. I, honestly, I don't have one. Really? I really don't. Like, I, I, so it's more whore or nothing? No, it's, no, not at all. Obviously, <laughs> I, need to, I, I ate it Jane Eyre yesterday, but that's great food. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't go and eat crap food. I, and I'm not trying to be pompous about it or anything. I just, I don't want to eat that. You know? um, next restaurant I go to is definitely going to be France and me. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it looks absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah. And then after France, and I want to eat at um, uh, Alchemist, the one that just went straight to two stars, and then you know it, know it, guide. Yeah, that just looks like the modern day El Boy, uh, like a Scandi version El Boy. Fifty courses, the room changes as you eat. Like it's, it looks. I mean, I saw a Anders Husser video on YouTube. Uh, and it just looked amazing. So yeah, definitely France and uh, and Alchemist for me next. Well, look, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Congratulations, everything you're doing here. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the future is going to be very bright. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this interview. And if you have any comments, feel free to tweet us or comment on the post. Uh, we're making all of our interviews available to download. And finally, if you like what we do, whether it's our podcast or our videos or even our features, please head over to our Patreon page and support us there. This episode of Grilled by the Staff Canteen is sponsored by Westlands, the premier specialist British grower of microleaf, growing cresses, edible flowers, inspired leaves, sea herbs and specialty tomatoes. Visit www.westlandsuk.co.uk to find out more.